a review of common insulation choices. Um, and a lot of, I, in many ways, I think people make too much uh, of the insulation choice. Uh, yes, it matters, but it doesn't matter that much. Um, as I have hinted at already, a much bigger decision is at the high level is most important where do you put the insulation relative to other layers biggest importance second is how much of it and then we get into the properties the, the third uh, level of decision making is what material properties do i want that insulation to have and then you start having to ask tougher questions so what is thermal insulation well it's it's just a product that has the function that you've identified by labeling an insulation of resisting the flow of conductive heat transfer. Uh, so low thermal conductivity, maybe I should say combined with high appropriate thickness. Um, but I mentioned that insulation products, often we, we look at them as having a thermal conductivity of 0.1 or less uh, and really commercially available products almost always below 0 0.05 watts per meter Kelvin. What does that mean in our value? Usually, if you're not providing R2 per inch, we wouldn't sell it as an insulation, just sort of saying. Um, now, we have other kinds of insulation, and in other languages, they're more precise about it. We often just say insulation, but in other languages uh, in, that I know, in, in Europe, you would often find them being specific about it is thermal insulation. To distinguish from sound insulation, um, which we haven't used as much historically in North America, but we are, as we get to higher density buildings, we're using that more, that term more. So keep that in mind. There's even fire insulation, by the way, as well. So here's a list of commonly uh, used insulation products. Now I say commonly used today and in the recent past, and there are reasons to think that the selection of materials will change over your career because there will be different uh, expectations and requirements about performance. So um, there's fiberglass is what most people think of, fiberglass bat insulation, stone wool insulation. It should be, uh, made clear that when we say the word mineral wool, we're talking about fibrous insulations that have been matted together into a wool that could be made out of any kind of mineral basis. Glass is one kind, stone is another, slag is a third. Those are all mineral wools. And uh, you'll see a lot of people in industry inaccurately banding about the term mineral wool as if it only applies to stone wool or rock wool. Um, but actually, uh, mineral wool is quite technically defined as including fiberglass insulation. So these products are made out of materials that would not at first glance seem to be good insulation. I mean, glass is not a good insulator. If you're not convinced of that, you should probably take a glass of drinking glass pour boiling water out of it, and then grab on. Now, I think you shouldn't do that because you will burn your hand because glass is a very bad insulator. However, both of these product categories, they make, they make good insulation by using the glass sparingly. It is very fluffy, lightweight. It is usually 98% air. Uh, a stone wool or fiberglass product. And bad insulations can actually get into the 99% air. And that means that there's just not a lot of material to conduct heat. And so the purpose of these fibers is to block radiation and to stop convection, to stop the movement of air and to stop radiation. And so they have to balance off using as little of the material as possible um, to not increase conduction but enough of it to stop radiation convection. That's the magic of how they design these products um, out of highly conductive materials. Now, then we move into the polymer products like polyiso, polystyrene, and they are foamed plastics. Uh, polystyrene, for example, is a plastic that's widely used in non-foamed versions 
say uh, the inside of your fridge is almost always made out of polystyrene. It gives a very nice smooth finish that's easy to clean and it's temperature to tolerant. But that's not foamed. It's not very insulating. It's not nothing like steel or glass, but it is not great. And so to make insulation, again, we have to make voids. And that is called foaming when it comes to uh, plastic insulations. And all of these products that I've listed next are polyurethane, polystyrene, uh, polyester cyanurate, which is kind of like a polyurethane, um, are all highly foamed. So these products tend to be 75, 80% uh, voids. And the way you can get higher R values is to fill those bubbles with insulating gases. Don't fill them with air, but fill them with some sort of magic gas. And that's how we can get higher thermal properties uh, out of them with some consequence. So uh, the gases that we originally used to make plastics foam up were, uh, the classic one was Freon. Some of you may have heard of Freon as a trade name. Um, uh, RSI, uh, sorry, it has uh, the number R12, I think. And um, so the problem with Freon was that if it leaked out, and it would always, some of it would leak out, um, it would eat holes in the ozone layer. So this was a big problem, which it took them a while to figure this out, by the way, that it was a problem. And they, when, when, it, was where, when it was clear that this was a problem, uh, the major manufacturers began to phase it out. And so by the night, they, they discovered this late 70s, mid 70s, uh, and by the late 80s to early 90s, um, we end up with products being sold that say, hey, I don't have Freon anymore. And what they said instead was they said, zero ozone depletion potential, ODP. This is something that you'll still see people advertising saying, yay, I have zero ozone depleting. That is so three generations ago. Of course, the gases they use shouldn't deplete ozone anymore, and they don't. The next problem was the replacement gases that were used to replace Freon, which depleted ozone, had very high carbon global warming potential. So basically, it, it equivalents of carbon. And for a, they had numbers like for one kilogram of gas that they would use in the 1980s and 1990s, it could have a thousand kilograms equivalent CO2 global warming potential. And so sometime around 2010, they started advertising the next generation. So we went from the first generation Freon, destroyed the ozone, generation two, didn't destroy ozone, but destroyed, had a huge global warming potential. So now we're on to say generation three, if you will, where they've now got gases that uh, do not have high global warming potentials. Some of them are literally, uh, you know, one to one, same as carbon dioxide, very small number. Others are maybe five or six. So very low global warming potential. So that's the discussion today in these, the gases used to blow some of these foam insulations. So let me just go through this list and I'm gonna to get to uh, Elizabeth and Jennifer's questions. So polyisocyanurate is, is uh, a product that is widely used in roofing. It is about 90%, 95% maybe even of market share for low slope commercial roofs for reasons that we'll get into. It was one of the first products that transitioned from not just low uh, uh, ozone depletion, but also low global warming potential. What they do to make the foam in most polyiso these days is they use carbon dioxide with uh, a little bit of uh, pentane and so on. Now that goes, if I can jump to Max's comment, that resulted in the fact that although they tested the performance of the insulation at room temperature, ironically, uh, that's where the standard temperature is for testing insulation. You know, the temperature where you don't need any insulation value, that's where they tested it. 
Um, well, when we tested it, and I'm saying we because literally in the building I'm in is where we actually tested 20 years ago, yeah, maybe 15 years ago, we began to test polyiso insulations and we at, at temperatures where it was say minus 10 outside and 20 inside. And when we tested that, we found that the thermal performance, the R value per inch dropped precipitously. And meaning instead of being a very good insulator, it became a mediocre insulator. And when we tested it at like minus 20, minus 25, it became a pretty shitty insulator. Um, needless to say, the industry wasn't very happy with us. And, and, and they went through the standard phases of, you know, you guys are wrong, to it doesn't really matter, to we can't do anything about it, to now most, pro most, most manufacturers over those 15 years have just now come up with releasing new products that don't have this problem. So now there are several products in the marketplace which work at cold temperatures as well. So this, these are complicated products, these foam. It's like, how do you get the right bubbles? What do you fill the bubbles with? Do they work at all kinds of conditions? And the big one is, is, is do they burn? And how badly do they burn is, is a fire performance. So, um, to uh, Elizabeth's point, can all of these be used in a wall and in a roof? Yes, uh, and and more, and we will talk about and the and more. But that's why, that's why it's important that you as an architect know about these things because it depends on what how you use these insulations. Where in the assembly do you use the insulation, and uh, how, how is the assembly designed to accommodate them? Okay. Um, so, and we're going to get into why, how you'd make those decisions. Now, to Jennifer's point, does XPS or EPS have insulating gases that can be released if cut for studio models, for example? Um, yes. Uh, as I mentioned, polyiso, uh, XPS, and closed cell spray polyurethane foam, those three products have special gases in them that are actually kind of fancy gases that have low global warming potential, don't burn, low, no ozone depletion potential, et cetera. Expanded polystyrene, Jennifer, doesn't have, it does not use special gases to expand it, to make the foam. And, um, but when you cut through XPS, the amount, remember these pores, these bubbles are miniature in size. They are a hundredth of a millimeter in diameter. And so when you cut through a piece of extruded polystyrene, you're only cutting through very tiny bubbles. And that means that a not meaningful amount of gas is released, okay? It, it's, you're not wrong. If I were doing uh, building science CSI and I had a really expensive equipment, I probably could detect uh, gases when you cut the XPS, but in terms of having any other meaning other than I can measure to one parts per billion, it would matter. Um, so what's more issue at issue is can polyiso, extruded polystyrene, enclosed cell spray polyurethane foam, can they lose their gases over time? And the short answer to that is yes. There, it's only a matter now of rate. If you read what it says on extruded polystyrene boards, they provide you a guarantee that you won't lose 10% of your R value in 30 years. That's their, their statement of strength to say, our product doesn't lose a lot of gases over time, but it does lose some. And so does polyiso and so does spray polyurethane foam. So depending on your view of the future, whether you're looking for a 75 year uh, common insulation or whether you believe that the building will be renovated, updated or demolished in that time zone, you may care more or less about some of these gases. But as the industry asks some of these questions, it is uh, making them think about, well, although these are really nice insulation products for a number of reasons, maybe I want something that keeps its R value the same for the next hundred years. And what products can do that? Actually, stone wool, fiberglass, uh, expanded polystyrene, 
uh, and open cell spray polyurethane foam. All of those will have constant R values over the next, I guess, say 100 years. Um, so that may factor into some of your concerns. Now, to answer a little bit more of these details, I want to go through a couple of slides here. So, um, because the answer to can I use it in the roof or a wall or, um, you know, what's a good product for my, really depends on understanding the characteristics. So I want to point out there are four kinds of insulation material categories. And on the left-hand side, I have mineral fiber, organic fiber, plastic foam, or mineral foam. That's the categories into which we can fit most in pretty much all insulation products. I can't think of any of that. Aerogel, by the way, is, is, is a weird one, but it's mineral. It's a mineral foam. So mineral fibers. The advantage of using minerals is that they are they tolerate moisture, meaning they don't feed mold or decay, um, and they don't burn. That is the big strength of mineral fiber and the big reason why fiberglass was the dominant product for so many years. Now, it's tolerant of moisture, but it you know you don't want necessarily too much of it. Um, so the problem with fibers when you put them together is that as an insulation, that's not an issue, but if you're also interested in how it performs in terms of vapor control and air control, the fact that it's fibrous means air goes through it and vapor goes through it like, like poo through a goose. And so the fibrous nature, the fact that it's 97, 98, 99% air, means that all it does is stop heat flow. So that's one category of products. Now we go to organic fiber. The original insulations that we chose were organic fibers. And I mean, we could include wood and cork in this category. Maybe I should add those. Um, but they're, they're not as good an insulation product as things like cellulose, cotton, wool, and straw. The problem with organic fibers is that organic materials are sensitive to moisture. You know, they will to a greater or lesser extent be feasted on by mold and will rot and decay over time. They also burn. Now, they may not burn a lot, but they will burn. And so you have to worry about managing their combustibility. So you see how if we look at the, the performance, because it's a fiber, it still has high vapor permeance and high air permeance. But the difference between mineral fibers and organic fibers is that organic fibers are both sensitive to moisture and combustible. Now that moves us into the plastic foam world and the polystyrenes, polyurethanes, polyisos. Um, they are tolerant uh, even more than mineral in some ways to moisture, but uh, they are combustible. And that's the trade-off that we're making is that it, it will burn, but it will tolerate a lot of moisture. But one of the reasons that people use plastic foam um, is that it has the ability to be relatively air tight slash air resistant. And you have a range of vapor resistance that you can choose from. You can make products that are quite low vapor permeance, quite low. So if you wanna combine the insulation properties with some of the other control layers, plastic foam offers you that chance. And so as an uh, example, the spray foam, and I'll show you some photo photographs so that people can cue, the spray foam that we see in this KW region a lot on the outside of commercial institutional buildings um, is chosen because not that it just insulates well, but because it also does a great job of, of being an air barrier, and it can also be a water and vapor barrier. So all of the control layers can be provided by that one product. And so they're willing to put up with the fact that it burns and it's made out of plastic um, because it, it does all these neat things. Then we get to the, the rarest class of product, and that would be mineral foams. So uh, as a manufactured product, we have something called foam glass, been around for, I think, 70 years or more, actually, uh, maybe 80 years. And it is what it sounds like. They take glass and then they bubble 
uh, a gas through it that creates these very tiny bubbles. And the foam glass is really quite lightweight and it's mostly air voids. It has quite good insulations uh, values. It doesn't burn and it's completely tolerant to moisture. It stops all vapor and it's air and airtight. So you might ask, geez, that sounds like a pretty good product. Why don't I use it? It costs a lot of money. Now, by a lot of money, I mean twice as much as normal insulation. So not crazy. And that's why it is used in many high value applications. But it's still a pretty rare thing. And I bet none of you have actually ever touched it um, in, in your life. Um, but by the way, you have to be careful when you touch it because it is glass. It is kind of abrasive on your fingers, like cuts them. Um, the natural product that is like foam glass that comes from volcanic eruptions where the the, the lava is blo basalt blown through the air, it actually entrains bubbly air, uh, bubbles in it, is called pumice. And pumice is a product that is used as a natural insulation, but it, there's just not a lot of it out there, right? But there, it is a product. Um, then there's aircrete, which is, instead of glass, they use versions of uh, Portland cement and make bubbles in it using usually magnesium oxychloride cements that bubble and they create a foamy concrete. And then the ultimate in mineral foams is aerogel. Here we're using silica. And the trick about aerogel is that through very careful process controls, not only does it have a lot of bubbles, but the bubbles are really, really tiny. The bubbles are in less than a millionth of a meter in diameter, so quite often significantly less, approaching a few, maybe tens of billionths of a meter. And they have very tiny bubbles. And that has some uh, big advantages in terms of heat, how it gets its heat flow control. That's how it gets really good heat flow control. So, but the combination of moisture tolerance, fire resistance is actually at core to how you would make decisions and why certain products would be used. Now, you, I just wanted to say these categories are, are real important categories you understand, but we also have this categorization of what form does the insulation come in? And I've used the term several times, but bat insulation is a very low density product that is typically held in place by friction. It's quite low density and um, easily compressed. Um, loose insulation is actually um, literally just, it comes in bags. You can buy most products in loose form, like fiberglass, cellulose, stone wool, and even things like expanded polystyrene are available as just the beads. Um, and that is useful in that you can pour them into irregular shaped voids like concrete blocks and, and attics. Um, it's the lowest cost form of insulation, uh, but it is easily compressed and settles and doesn't have any strength at all. Roll is the step up from bat where they usually provide some sort of facer to hold the the, the bat insulation together comes in a long roll and they use this particularly in pre-engineered metal buildings. Then we get to board insulation, which is the most common for roofs and walls in institutional commercial buildings where uh, the board has its own, it can stand up on its own. So you literally can take a board insulation, set it on the table and it won't collapse. Whereas fiberglass bat will not be able to support any kind of weight at all. Um, and so the boards uh, have a range of densities uh, from somewhat light to really dense. And this is, as you get denser insulation, you can put more weight on them. And again, in a physical class, I would hand out to you samples of all of these products, everything except loose, um, so that you can get a sense of, of, of what they can and can't do. And this goes to some of Elizabeth's question about, can I use it in a roof or a wall? Well, for example, do you mean in a roof an attic? Because in an attic, uh, a wood truss attic, I can use complete like fluffy stuff. I can use straw or cellulose or whatever, 
blow it in there, very lightweight and it, very fluffy. But if I'm using a low slope commercial roof, as on most buildings where you have insulation then a roof membrane on top of it, that insulation now has to be strong enough that I can walk on it and often strong enough that wind cannot rip it apart when it blows on that. So that immediately means we're dealing with some form of board or uh, spray insulation. It needs to be uh, have some real mechanical strength. Uh, that doesn't rule out a material category, but it does rule out a form of the insulation. Um, and then we have the spray stuff, which is really, uh, it's what it says, it's spray it in place. Um, and usually it, it sticks to surfaces and holds on to them, but it is somewhat flexible. So again, combine the material categories. There's four of them. That's four, right? Uh, with the five uh, forms and you have 20 possible mixes that a product could fit into. And uh, when I talk about something like polyurethane or expanded polystyrene, that's actually just a, a subcategory of one type of material. Then you can ask, is it spray polyurethane? Is it polyurethane boards? Is it polyurethane in beads that are, um, you know, given to you loose? Um, you know, that's the kind of subdivisions that you make. Many people think, not without reason, that the primary thing to worry about in choosing insulation is what is its thermal conductivity or what is its R value per inch. Now, I've listed these common insulation types here. Uh, I don't know how many of them I got, like eight there, um, and R value per inch. Um, so we see that the range of R values per inch is not that high, the, meaning that it goes from about uh, 3.6 per inch up to about six per inch. And some people claim more than six per inch, but the claims are something to be a bit worried about that they might not really get there. And the comment that I think Max made about low temperature in polyiso is the reason for that little uh, light orange thing at um, polyiso. They, they tried to say it was R6.5, R7, and now pretty much everyone has walked that back. And R6 is about as good as you can get. Now, I would counsel you not to get obsessed by decimal points. So for my world, I like to think of it as R4 insulations, five insulations, six insulations, because there's so many other variables at hand that uh, just recognize that these are categorizations. There's expanded polystyrene is increasingly available in an R4 per inch range. Uh, just, you know, different product formulations and densities, my primarily densities, uh, are available that will uh, get you slightly better R value per inch. But, and uh, just realize that, you know, cellulose, open cell foam, you know, they're a little less than four. Uh, rock wool bat and stone wool uh, rigid boards a little over four, but you know, around four. Then there's extruded that's at around five. And then there's these polyiso polyurethane around R6. So that's probably all the practical knowledge you need. Um, so when you're making choices about what insulation to use, uh, whether it's roof or wall or below grade, whether you're using it um, in, in a particular type of project, um, we get other factors in our value dominate the decision making. The first things that we make uh, decisions on are things like fire resistance, moisture, tolerance, it's mechanical strength. Can I walk on it? As I said, on the low slope roof, um, it's vapor permeance and air permeance. All of those factors tend to be more important than our value per inch. And today I would say, we're starting to see more questions about the environmental footprint uh, of the products is also important. And people are routinely making choices to use lower R value per inch products that have a better environmental footprint. And that all they're doing is trading off instead of a 10 inch wall, it's an 11 or 12 inch wall, but it has a better environmental footprint. That's the kind of choices that we're making. 
And as I said, insulation products, the normal ones, are really inexpensive. And yet, it surprises me how much people obsess about it. Now, it's starting to change, but really, like I said, if you're talking about a, a typical building assembly, you know, we're, we're routinely spending 20, 30, $40 a square foot on the cladding system, double that for more uh, high end architecture. We're spending, you know, 10 bucks to maybe as much as 20 bucks a square foot on the support structure. And we're arguing about whether we should spend 250 or four dollars per square foot on the insulation, which seems in the in the context it seems uh, rather ridiculous. So let's take a, a little bit of a, a photo survey of some insulation products. On the left hand side, we have an example of stone wool insulation um, installed as bats between studs. Uh, that the, the kind of greenish gray color is is typical for stone wool. They don't color it. Fiberglass is famously um, pink. And of course, fiberglass isn't pink. That is a branding decision which is used in business school all the time to say, what a great idea. Uh, making the fiberglass pink made a brand. Um, really stand out. So uh, Silas asks, um, is fiberglass okay to touch? Well, it's okay, but if you do too much, it does scratch you, right? It gets scratchy and annoying. Um, so it depends, are you doing this every day uh, for all day, or are you just moving a few bags around or doing a small reno, right? So um, just keep that in mind. But so they're not like, it's not that bad. Um, does insulation tend to have a high carbon footprint as a percentage of the carbon footprint of the entire building? No, quite the opposite. Insulation tends to have a rather small component. Uh, I, I won't say insignificant because we're trying to chip away on everything, but it's certainly a small percentage of the overall building. Some of the biggest impacts are things like, uh, well, the electronics and controls and buildings, the ex, the fancy, the fancier the exterior finish, the general, the higher the embodied carbon. So remember, there's a lot of the reason it's expensive is that there's a lot of uh, processing, transport, uh, and resources that go into making that product. So if it's expensive, uh, it's not a bad guess that it also has a high carbon content. It's when the expense is due to high labor that it doesn't have as high a carbon content. Then the, then the expense is a bad metric. So insulation, and we're going to get into a little bit about how you could not have to guess at this, uh, because there are ways to answer that question quite precisely uh, for a particular product that you're interested in. And so you can start getting a good number off of this stuff. That's That's what's happened in the last few years is that just like our value, I can give you a number for your rock wool, fiberglass, or cellulose insulation. Now, I wanted to point out that rock wool comes in uh, in denser formulations. So does fiberglass, but it's rarely used because it's more expensive. If you want a specific uh, compressive strength uh, in a product, it's more expensive to do that with fiberglass than with rock wool. And so as most big fiberglass insulation manufacturers have purchased or developed stone wool, rock wool production capacity, the they just don't sell their more expensive fiberglass stuff anymore because there's no reason to. And so for higher density board products, it does tend to end up being stone wool. So this is an example of uh, a stone wool board insulation being used. And this is great because it goes to, I think, Elizabeth's question. Um, it's like, here it is, I'm using it on the walls, I'm using it on a steep roof, and I'm using it on a, uh, on a relatively low slope roof. Uh, not a, not a, a low slope roof, but a, a two and 12 pitch roof. So that insulation has a range of densities. I can buy it with whatever kind of strength I want. And Notice that it is put over an air and water membrane that's labeled del Delta Vent SA and made continuous with all the windows. So this is strong enough that I can hang my cladding from it. 
So what you're looking at there are one by fours that are screwed every about 24 to 30 inches vertically into the wood substructure over which cladding will be attached. And in fact, the insulation is often strong enough that the overhangs are being tacked on and attached um, to uh, connect. And yes, uh, Max, that's why the it is okay to walk on, although I guess it would say, if you walked on stone wool without any protection over, eventually you would, sc you, you would scuff it up, right? You can walk over it, but if you made it, say, the walkway uh, to your kitchen, uh, it would wear down, it get compacted, and fibers would come loose. Now, if you put a, a layer of OSB over top of stone wall and walk on that, well, then it'll last for freaking ever. So here's some examples in a more commercial application. Uh, rock wool is being used here because of its moisture tolerance, by the way, in both of these, here and here, it's being used because of its moisture tolerance. Um, and that unlike cellulose or wood fiberboard or something like that, um, rock wool can take, it'll get wet, it'll dry out, and then it's not hurt by that. Another factor in these more commercial buildings, uh, the, the previous one was a residential low rise. This is commercial high rise. And as a consequence, fire matters more. It's, it's, it's harder for people to get to safety um, if a fire breaks out. And so one of the driving forces in these applications is not just the moisture tolerance, because that could be dealt with by using foam, plastics. It's the fire and the combination of moisture tolerance and fire resistance. Uh, and I'm showing you the image on the right partly because notice the size of the air cavity behind some of those uh, vertical strips of metal uh, cladding. Those are big enough that I can climb into them. And that means that fire spread through those voids is a real risk. It would concern building, uh, building code officials everywhere greatly. And that's exactly the kind of application where people want to use the best fire resistant insulation they can, but they're still relying on insulation uh, outside uh, the sheathing and the membranes to deliver performance. Here I'm showing you, a, this is actually a passive house foundation um, and in Alaska. Um, and so they're piling in lots of below grade insulation. This is some, I uh, forget who was it who asked about over insulating. Well, in our climate, this would be over insulating in the sense that we'd be using a lot of resources to make that foam and a lot of carbon relative to the amount that it could save. But this is where we would use EPS, expanded polystyrene, R4 per inch. Uh, most of the time we see EPS used on walls. Because EPS is one of those foam plastics that doesn't use a special gas to, it uses steam to foam it, um, it's one that will have pretty consistent R value over time. You can be pretty confident of that R value over time. Um, so there's a whole range of different products. And like I mentioned, the stone wool, you can get different densities. Well, expanded polystyrene, you get bit different densities. At the lowest density, they're very resource efficient, but they're not as strong and their R value per inch isn't as great. Um, so you'll notice here, this is a, a table you would find on a product data sheet. Under thermal resistance, it shows you in, in, in imperial terms, the R value per inch. Um, and so these are all higher density products right now. 16 PSI, 20, 25, 30, 40 PSI. And you can see their R value gets as high as 4.3 per inch. Anyway, um, extruded polystyrene. <clears throat> this is a product many of you know, and I think someone mentioned, you know, even just from uh, working in, um, in studio building models, you might use ext uh, extruded polystyrene because it actually is stronger and has smaller bubbles and voids, so it actually allows for more precise cutting. Um, 
and really, by the way, the, the problem with cutting this stuff is when you use a hot wire to cut it and that melts some of the plastic. That produces gases uh, that you don't want to breathe too much of. Uh, but the gas release is not bad. A couple things to note here. Um, there are two dominant product uh, manufacturers of extruded. Extruded takes a fair bit of money to build the factory for the first time. So it means that there's only a couple of big players and a couple of small players in all of North America. And the big player, the gorilla in the room is Dow Chemical, um, Styrofoam, the blue color. So, you know, that's another one of those classic branding moves. They learned that the blue really mattered. Now, the blue color on the left, there's four inches, and you probably can't read it. I can barely see it on my screen, but it's actually labeled with R20, right? It's an R20 four inch board. Notice the CMU is the backup support structure. Um, and notice that they have a membrane and that is a air and water membrane. So this is the perfect wall. They're working on the perfect wall here. On the right-hand side, we see the other big player, which is Owens Corning, the people who kept brought you the pink fiberglass. They eventually saw that um, they couldn't be in the insulation business if they didn't sell foam plastics. And so they got into making um, extruded polystyrene, which is, uh, again, you see that board is labeled as two inches R10. Uh, it's used in a place where it makes a lot of sense below grade. So extruded polystyrene has the most moisture tolerance of all of the insulations. Of The only one that might do better would be foam glass, a pretty rare choice. But extruded polystyrene, pretty remarkable in terms of moisture tolerance. Now, um, the left-hand side picture, you'll notice that there are metal Z bars or Z bars in the United States that are being penetrating through that insulation to make it easy to attach cladding. I, uh, the problem with that design, as we'll find out, is that you lose more than half of the R value of that insulation was lost by thermal bridging through those Z bars, even though it doesn't look like much. I know there's only a relatively thin sheet of, of metal every 24 inches, but it's a killer, folks. Uh, and so why would I choose one company or the other? I wouldn't. It didn't matter one bit at all. They're essentially the same freaking product. So you would choose based on other factors, price, availability, local support. I like pink versus blue. Those are all valid choices to choose one or the other. There's no difference in the products. But the thermal bridging is an example of the power that architecture has. You ask questions about carbon, how much insulation, et cetera. But really important is that the design choice by the architect to use uh, Z bars of steel through the insulation on, the, on that left-hand drawing, a photo, uh, means that a massive amount of performance was lost and whatever carbon was invested, and it's non-trivial in extruded foam, it's a pretty high carbon product, relatively speaking, half of it was wasted because of the architectural decision to attach the cladding by using Z bars. And so there's a lot that one can do as an architect by using design rather than specification of products um, to solve these problems. So, Jennifer asked, does XPS have to be protected from backfill? And if so, by what? By what? Actually, Jennifer, it's totally okay just to dump dirt up against it. And that's what I mean by its moisture tolerance. Extruded polystyrene is widely used to insulate water lines and sewer lines and below grade foundations and ice, ice hockey arenas. And it absolutely is okay to put that insulation right against the dirt. The, the technical challenge that you have as an architect or as I as an engineer is designing how do I protect it as it goes above grade? Because above grade is where the problem is because that's where the sun can get at it and that'll make the plastic fade and fall apart. And that's where it looks like crap. And so I have to figure out how do I finish it in a way that's aesthetically pleasing. 
but actually it's totally okay to just bury the insulation. So we're gonna get into how one attaches cladding through continuous insulation effectively later in the course. It's a, it's a whole separate thing and it's a modern challenge that needs to be dealt with. So let me just move to another example. This is residential housing. The red tape you see there, some of you may know it quite well, um, the red tape is being used to convert this styrofoam insulation into a water and air barrier. So the product itself is water and airtight, but you have to then seal the joints. And by doing this, you're getting more value out of that uh, insulation. So it's no longer just insulation, like it was in the last drawing it, photo. It is now insulation, air, and water tightness. It's providing multiple functions, and that's a benefit. Uh, and it also spreads that carbon investment over you know, more functionality. Um, here's an example, just because I have a nice photograph of insulation that is about to be have a concrete floor slab put on top. <clears throat> and just to uh, go to Jennifer's point again, it's completely reasonable here. You could pour, pour concrete directly on top of this foam and there'd be nothing wrong with that at all. Um, this insulation happens to be LT40 uh, and it is for a freezer warehouse. So uh, they're basically going to, when this floor is finished on top of this, this building will get to be at minus 18 degrees Celsius for the next lifespan, for the next 30 years. Uh, and so they have to uh, make sure that they're not sucking heat out of the ground for a whole bunch of reasons. I don't know if anybody uh, here is from uh, Fergus, Ontario. This is uh, the rec center at Fergus. Um, this is the second time we did it. Uh, well, uh, we as a, as a society. So the first time, uh, they didn't get uh, the air barrier good enough. And then after a few years, I think four or five years, the stone started falling off the wall. And so this was our chance to do the second time. Um, <laughs> wow, Silas, that's a very fast response. You were able to snip that and put it in there. <laughs> um, that's fantastic that you right away caught that. So just to show that, you know, there are real personalities on job sites. Uh, some of them are really fun. And um, so the solution here for insulating, because it was a swimming pool and because it had failed, they didn't want to trust just the membrane. Even though the membrane should be enough to provide an air or water barrier, no problem. Once burned, twice shy. And they really liked the idea of using spray foam, which provided not just insulation, but also an air barrier. And that's why we see a fair bit of this being used. Couple of points here on the left, you see a CMU as the support structure and spray foam as the air, water, in this case, air, water, and vapor, as well as thermal, all the control airs, and then brick put over top. Uh, and people driving by this building would probably say, notice that um, it's a very solid looking building that looks like it'll still be in style in 30 to 40 years and low maintenance exterior, et cetera. And yet it has some pretty high tech details uh, going on to get some pretty good performance. The way the cladding is attached here, you can just barely see a few clips. Um, in this project, you can also see clips. Notice the Z didn't go through. That was originally the proposal and uh, by the contractor. And uh, as building scientists on the jobs, you know, we went, ah, don't do that. You'll throw away all that insulation value. And so uh, we were able, we could do some calculations and demonstrate that using clips spaced, as you see, um, on a, something like a 36 vertical by 24 horizontal, or even more than that, it was something like that, uh, meant that the thermal penetrations were modest and uh, totally tolerable. Here we're seeing the clips being to attach the brick are also relatively small and spaced. On the right-hand side, we're using wood. This is a renovation of a building in uh, the Yukon Territory. Um, and it is using a piece of wood with little blocks of foam uh, to support the furring strips. So. 
So you can see the ver vertical furring strips and the little blocks there, they're actually pre-cut chunks of foam. They spray foamed around them. And this is a um, quite a practical technique of retrofitting some of these uh, buildings to quite high performance levels. I used polyisocyanurate as, a, uh, as, as an example, widely used for roofing. Um, but also I'd like to point out that it is used for walls. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see um, the, the a foil facing, which is common, aluminum foil facing, it's shiny. You can see the furring strips again. See how the screws go through the insulation? Uh, so there's an option other than, a Z, uh, than the Z-bar right there, Serena. It's one of the most powerful options. It's cheaper than a Z-bar, and it's about 10 times thermally better, maybe 20 times thermally better. But it's different, which is why people aren't always sure. Uh, but you could be. Um, and on the right-hand side, we see the upper story. This is a house in, in a place called Listowel, Ontario. Um, a foil-faced insulation on the top and plastic-faced insulation on the bottom. And this one actually, notice how they've la labeled it energy shield, continuous wall insulation. So it's back to this idea, uh, the industry is starting to recognize continuity matters. You can't see the tape very clearly on the left side, but you can on the right side because of the contrasting colors. Um, and again, by having a smooth finish, especially the aluminum finish, tape sticks to this like poo to diapers. And it means that you can convert that foil-faced polyisocyanurate insulation into a very effective air and water barrier. This is not the perfect wall per se, but it's very close. Uh, but it is uh, an economic option that builders love. And so this is for uh, high production, low bang for buck, or sorry, high bang for buck, low cost, but getting as much as you can. This is something that's widely used. Now, I wanted to end with uh, a few conversations about ecological building materials, partly to align with your um, studio. And we're going to talk a little bit about ecological, oh, sorry, environmental product declarations and carbon content of materials at, at later time. I might actually make a separate video for that as a resource for you to look up on just talking about how to identify carbon content, how do you make judgments in a building. But ecological materials have long been used for insulation. Um, so, and I, I put quotes around ecological since I don't know what it really means. Since there's no good metric for it, it's just that most of us see it as a low process, renewable uh, product, hopefully that's locally available. Now, I didn't include, and I should maybe have included cork, uh, cork is interesting, but the problem with cork is that there's not there's only a certain amount of it in the world. Um, we are not planting lots and lots of cork trees, and cork can only be removed from those trees every so often. So right now, there is a surplus of cork um, available because uh, only a certain amount of that cork can be used for its proper and God-identified purpose, which is sealing bottles of red wine but there is still lots of lower grade cork available that they can use to make boards out of. Cork is pretty fascinating in that it has quite remarkable moisture tolerance, more than any other ecological building material that I know of, uh, but it's still a little moisture sensitive. Um, but more commonly would be, well, let's say straw I put first on the list because historically, straw was widely used, straw, straw seagrass, etc. cetera. Um, cellulose is the most commercially developed product. You can specify cellulose insulation in most markets in the United States without any effort at all. You just literally put it in the spec. They treat the cellulose to make it have quite exceptional fire resistance. Untreated cellulose can be a little bit of a, a, a fire explosion. So you gotta be careful. Sawdust historically was used a lot in Canada's uh, pioneering days because one of the first things we did after we began killing all the beavers is we began cutting down all the trees. And while cutting down all the trees, we ended up with a lot of sawdust. 
And so sawdust was seen was a low cost product. And this is similar again, let me point out all this insulation, low cost, straw, a waste product from growing barley to make beer. Uh, cellulose, a waste product from recycling newspapers. Sawdust, waste product from making wood. Sheep's wool, not quite a waste product, you might think, except you'd be wrong. Most sheep do not produce wool of a high enough quality to be worth making into sweaters. And so there are a lot of sheep that are made for meat or milk that the wool is not uh, useful uh, for making clothing. At least it's not good stuff. And so there's often a lot of sheep's wool available in places like New Zealand or Wales that they could use to make insulation. All of these ecological uh, materials tend to have moisture sensitivity and they are combustible. They have R values that could be as good as four per inch, but um, not a lot better than that. About four per inch would be the top of the line, and a lot of them are unfortunately down around two and a half or so. So I'm going to show you a few pictures here. This is looking into an attic, um, and this is an Ontario attic, I think. Uh, I forget now where this picture was taken, and they've blown loose cellulose into this. Um, so yeah, so uh, with respect, another one that was raised by Anuk was uh, denim. Yeah, denim's okay. Uh, it, it, the, it doesn't have great properties, but it really does depend on, so do you have a lot of denim available? You know, it depends where you are. Are you close to a Levi's factory? Maybe. It still is moisture sensitive, so it will grow mold. I have a, uh, I had a forensic investigation case where they used uh, denim insulation in the basement of a house in South Carolina, and it to to was a total mold fest because they were stupid. Um, so you got to keep it dry, more so than fiberglass or, or rock wool. Um, and um, there's just a limited amount of it. So if you have some sort of special access to it, sure. But um, it's expensive because there's not that much of it available. So then we have the cellulose. It comes in bags on the left-hand side. And if you go to the home despot, you can buy the bags and it is blown through a machine on the right. And the machine on the right, you can rent from uh, the Home Depot when you want to insulate your own attic. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, is fiberglass scratchy? It is. And cellulose is really dusty. And it's more of a, an annoyance than anything else. Um, but you dump these bags in the hopper where the guy's got his arm in there and it grinds it up and blows it through that tube. And that tube could be as much as 100 feet away. Uh, and that then is blown in the attic. That's the, the lowest cost insulation that's commercially available. It's unbelievably inexpensive. Um, like, uh, you, you know, you can insulate your attic to R60 which would mean that you have something like 16 inches of insulation and it'll cost you maybe $1.50 a square foot. Really inexpensive. The next level up in cellulose is that they add a little bit of water with some glue in it and they spray it into walls and you end up with filling all kinds of voids, ma making up for irregular surfaces. So on the, these are, unfortunately not such great photos because it's actually kind of dusty when you get in there so most photographs end up looking like a whole bunch of dust particles so there's a dust there's there's the guy blowing the 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 cellulose into these stud walls on the left and on the right uh said dude is is scraping them they have a little rotating wheel that makes it nice and smooth and then they vacuum up the the cellulose that fell down and then blow it into the wall again. So it's actually quite an effective process. This is uh, sheep's wool insulation, the, the thing that my colleague Randy Van Stratton is fondling there. Uh, and the smiling man on the right is a researcher from the New Zealand Building Research Association. So this is in New Zealand and they have a lot of effing sheep in New Zealand. And most of the uh, sheep are being used for meat and wool. If you go to the, the, the 
I don't know, your local Zayers, your Loblaws, you're going to find that most of the sheep, unfortunately, the lamb meat is coming from New Zealand and they're not buying from Ontario. Uh, and they have a lot of wool left over. And so the wool is used to uh, make bat insulations. It's not terrible from a moisture point of view, but you do have to keep it. It's kind of like fiberglass that way. Insulates reasonably well. Uh, so I don't think there's, it burns. It's unlike fiberglass, so you have to protect it, but it doesn't burn a lot. Yeah, so we're gonna try and get to this, some of this stuff, Jennifer, is that for an attic like this, cellulose is widely used. It is used because it is inexpensive and it is treated for fire resistance. So it actually works quite well. And in this design, it's not supposed to get wet. You know, the architects are designing this assembly that water doesn't get into the space. So it is used in hundreds of thousands of house ceilings every year, right? That's a big number, right? It, I mean it. It is, that's its major market. The reason we don't use it in walls as much is that the installation labor for the walls is greater in most markets than fiberglass bat. But it is used in tens of thousands of houses of walls per year, depending on local variations. And so it works out fairly well. And with the cellulose, with the with the natural fire resistant borate added is actually the best fire resistant insulation to put in the stud space. And we're going to find out why not wool. It's more expensive, not readily available, is more of the issue, like the denim conversation. And now we can go to things like um, a little bit more off the beaten path. I think you'll agree is, is straw. Um, this is about maybe three per inch, probably a little less. But to Jennifer's point about, well, maybe we need some extra protective layers. This product really won't work and won't be fire safe unless you plaster both sides. So you have to plaster it with earth or lime or cement plaster um, uh, to a thickness of a certain amount, half an inch to an inch, so that it becomes fire resistant. Um, and then it actually can work out pretty well. It's still sensitive to moisture. Uh, but I'm pointing this out because it's a product that I've had a, a long history of and we've done some research. This weird photograph I'm showing you is actually at the University of Waterloo test hut where we put, build walls of various materials and actually measure their performance uh, over time. So this is uh, a guy by the name of Keith Dietrich who is donating his services to do cement lime plaster over top of a plastic mesh that is over top of the straw bale. And by the way, one of the reasons that straw bale walls insulate well is that they're thick. They're 14 to 18 inches thick. And although the R value per inch is decent, not great, it's thicker than most insulations, so those walls do really well. So this is a, a reasonable cold climate product because it has good insulation values. Um, this is the finished product on the left you um, you see the cement plaster and on the right or cement line and on the right we have earthen plaster uh, so the earthen plaster is a bit more exotic but frankly works better so elizabeth asks is it true you put a little window in the straw it is it was a bit of a tradition for a while it was called a truth window um, and it, they they would demonstrate just to demonstrate that really this wall is actually made out of straw because in the early days of the straw bale resurgence in the late 80s into the 90s where it was first being started, this, people would bang on the wall and it feels like so solid you'd just swear it was a masonry wall, and so they um, add the truth window. Oh yeah, and the grand house is our local connection. That I was quite involved in that project, although the limitation is that I would never have chosen straw bale for that complex of a building shape going down on stilts and all that. Um, but they managed to persevere um, and they actually have managed to work out a lot of details. Although that building, I'm not sure 
how well it's aged uh, compared to other choices that could have been made. One of the things we did learn, I mean, learn, one of the things we demonstrated, we knew this already, this is a close up of the cement line plaster. It, this, it'll always have natural cracks in it. That building is not tall, but exposed. And when we cut into the concrete through the cement line plaster after two years of exposure, this is me pulling out the rotten straw. And so that would be my worry about the Grand House as well. So the right, the way people are starting to use this product system a lot more is to put a air gap and uh, some sort of a rain screen cladding, a cladding that may leak water, but is ventilated and all that over top of this. Now that becomes a pretty reliable system. It's one step closer to the perfect wall. So I'm gonna end off on two slides here. Um, and there's the laboratory products that are kind of vacuum panels, aerogel, et cetera. They, you can look at, look these up if you're interested. Uh, and, and really the thing is that they work when you have a real need to have a slender wall. But in practice, you usually don't need to have a slender wall. You may think you do, but I'm just pointing out that you actually don't. Um, and so that's one of the changes that people need to get over. For 5,000 years, we had walls that were thicker. Uh, if you wanted a, a good building, you had walls that were 20, 30, and up to a meter thick. Then we got used to walls that were thin, but they sucked. Uh, they just performance-wise, fire, sound, structure, uh, and a thermal all perform poorly. The leftover we have of that is the curtain wall, right? The aluminum and glass curtain wall, it's like it, it existed uh, became popular in the 50s when we didn't care about comfort and energy. It got developed. It's now out there. They've tried to polish the turd, but frankly, its performance is pretty mediocre, even when you spend $200 a square foot. And that's what a good curtain wall costs. And so um, we have instead um, moved now to more opaque walls. Put like for the previous 5,000 years, putting windows where we needed them for view and daylight, not using it as a stylistic design. And as a consequence, opening up the possibility for better insulation uh, uh, enclosures. Even windows remain the biggest problem because they're the ones that we don't have good answers for. And I'm gonna end, I'll answer uh, some of your questions. I'm gonna end on the paints and coatings, which someone has already raised. Thin layers of very little impact on R value. So uh, right off the bat, if you know R value is, is uh, one over C, which means R equals L over K, L, the thickness of coatings is thin. And so no matter what we do with K, we're just not gonna get a very good R value because L is so darn small. Now <clears throat> they can change how radiation interacts. So you can make it white so it doesn't pick up the sun's heat. You can make it black so it does pick up the sun's heat. And we can play around with infrared by using low E coatings, which can also help. But you're not really using R value anymore. And so that's why you have to be very careful. Most paints and coatings are basically people who are just uh, trying to rip you off, uh, et cetera. What new envelope technology are you excited by? Uh, well, that's sort of a broad question. Um, frankly, I'm less, I'm not that excited by new technologies in, in, in enclosures. And that's because my experience has taught me that what's missing is people designing with the materials we already have. That's where the best bang for buck comes. Um, and frankly, I don't see a lot of new. I mean, I suppose if I talk about CLT is new-ish, but it really doesn't change anything. Mass veneer lumber, I'm not sure if you're aware of that. It's like CLT, except it's like plywood that's three and a half inches thick. Um, you know, but I'm not that excited by them because it doesn't change anything. It's just, okay, a new support system. Doesn't really rock my world. 
insulation types don't change, membranes don't change anything. It's the the choices and how we put them together. That's where the, the impact is. That's where my excitement ends up lying. 